Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the On the Pony Express podcast. I am Billy Embody. Thanks for listening. We've got a loaded edition for you guys today. Mailbag podcast, SMU football, recruiting, basketball, Pac-12 expansion and realignment, of course, and much, much more to come. But I do want to jump in with the news really of the week, and that is SMU running back Kamar Wheaton and wide receiver Teddy Knox returning to the team. Teddy Knox was at Friday's scrimmage as a full participant, um, but Kamar Wheaton did return on Tuesday when we were in the Armstrong Fieldhouse catching practice. Um, Both were ready to go. Teddy Knox looks smooth. He's a speedy slot that had a kind of a limited role in 2022. Certainly needs to show some more maturities, kind of you know, up to his overall craft, um, but he does have serious wheels, which he'll bring to the SMU offense. Hopefully, if he can keep everything in line in some fashion in 2023. With Kamar Wheaton, uh, he looked the part, um, looked fluid, looked like he moved around well. He's been working out with Sean Griswold uh, during the uh, time that he's been away. So he's been doing 6 a.m. workouts while focusing on academics. Uh, Keenan Hall talked him up. Uh, in a sense, you know, just saying how good he looked uh, and how that they were happy to have him back uh, with that suspension now behind him. So he's got to keep everything obviously in order as well. He's got a loaded backfield uh, fill, filled with competition that he's going to have to find a way to factor into now uh, that he's returned. But looked the part, caught the ball, ran the ball, did all the things, worked in with the ones and twos at times uh, during Tuesday's practice. So Kamar Wheaton's back. Defensive end, outside linebacker Jalen Samuels remains the lone uh, suspended player who's absent. Um, he is suspended due to violation of team rules and hasn't been out there during spring ball at all. So we'll continue to monitor his status. Um, but that was welcome news for SMU, as was the addition of assistant director of recruiting Tyler Foster. He comes over to SMU from Baylor and Oklahoma State. Uh, this is a Dallas guy who has you know really built – Uh, His resume in the recruiting ranks as a Dallas recruiter, I think he's going to have the chance to help SMU get in there even more with some of the prospects that they have on their recruiting board. We'll drop some notes at ontheponyexpress.com for our subscribers uh, on who to kind of watch uh, when it comes to Tyler Foster and what his impact might be. Um, You can subscribe for $10 a month to join the site and our message board, so check that out. We also appreciate all you guys who have subscribed to our YouTube channel. Reaching 870 subscribers now. Appreciate all you guys who have jumped on board. We're just 130 away from 1,000. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Just hit us with that subscribe. uh, Click on our YouTube channel. We appreciate you guys. We'll get to the mailbag in a minute. But first, I got to talk to you guys about our friends at Dank Vodka. Trey Feist, that whole crew... <clears throat> is doing a terrific job, obviously, with their vodka. They just became a premium label uh, when it comes to uh, total wine. So congratulations to the crew at Dank Vodka, the first terpene-based b- vodka uh, that you could find out there. They're in total wine specs and also available on Drizzly. Um, and I do want to tell you guys, Trey is going to be out leading tastings uh, in the area uh, um and, and the first one that we'll let you know is on Saturday. Uh, that is at Specs store number 174. It's in Rowlett. Trey will be out there from 2 to 5. So if you're in the Rowlett area, go try Dank Vodka. Tell him we sent you from On the Pony Express um, and say hello to Trey for us. Uh, he'll also be next week on Monday and Tuesday, April 3rd and 4th. He'll be at Total Wine uh, at the Austin Lake Line Mall. From 11 all the way until 8 p.m. So be sure, if you're in the Austin area, to go say what's up to Trey. He's a U.S. Army veteran. He's a Texan, born and raised. uh, Dank vodka, made in Waxahachie, Texas. So that's another reason why we love them. You can see the bottle. Really cool. Again, available specs, total wine, um, and available on Drizzly as well. So check it out. We're going to give you guys one more. Uh, tasting date, and we'll obviously update you guys next week on more um, on the 6th. So that would be Thursday, April 6th. He'll be at the Houston Galleria Mall location, the Total Wine location there, from 11 to 2. So be sure to stop in, say hello to Trey, try some Dank. It's flavorless, very smooth. Um, You guys saw it last week on the podcast. I drank it on the rocks, and it is terrific. So really nice 
vodka. It gives a little lemon zest in a sense, but it doesn't have that sharp vodka flavor to it. Very smooth. So we appreciate uh, all the help from Dank Vodka and being a friend of the show. Check them out. Um, and uh, if you have any more questions on the tastings, hit me up on our message board and appreciate all you guys who have chimed in that you've tried Dank. So moving in to our mailbag portion of the podcast, we're going to try and lead off with football questions, then go into recruiting, both basketball and football, and then finish up with realignment talk. Uh, so trying to keep you guys listening uh, to this voice that for some reason you guys do enjoy listening to um, so much. Appreciate you guys for checking us out, um, but keeping you guys on until the end for some Pac-12 uh, expansion talk. Question from SMU122311. Um, how does Preston Stone look? compared to where Tanner Mordecai was at this point last year. I think the thing with Preston Stone is, and we're we're starting to see it a little bit more, is he needs to continue to develop the trust in his deep ball. And we saw it last week, I think it was Thursday, where I said this was one of Preston Stone's best practices. And the reason it was is because he uncorked that deep ball with consistency and conviction and that was really important to see. And on Tuesday, when we got to see him, you know, we saw more of that. We saw more of his willingness to throw it down the field. Uh, he had a really nice touchdown pass to Muji Dixon. He had a couple other really nice throws in the team period. So that development, I would say, is still behind where Tanner Mordecai was this, this time last year. Tanner just had no problem airing it out in practice. I mean, if you go back and read our practice reports, a lot of it was SMU's going to throw the ball deep. SMU's going to throw the ball deep. And the health of the receiving core kind of limited that. You know, Rasheed Rice was really the only uh, productive, consistently healthy receiver, even though he played through the broken toe. And that impacted how they were able to attack the field uh, vertically. Jordan Curley, Moochie Dixon, Keyshawn Smith, Romello Brinson, um, Jake Bailey, when he returns, Roger Daniels. I mean, all these guys are going to be able to stretch the field in some way or another. It's just a matter of how Rhett Lashley and them kind of divvy up some of these, uh, you know, vertical shots, what the coverage dictates to these guys as well. Um, and that's where we've got to see the development continue to happen when it comes to throwing the ball deep. Now, as far as I think extending plays and willingness to run. Preston has that. He's much more advanced than Tanner Mordecai really ever has been in terms of extending plays, trusting his legs, um, and you know, willing to do that. And that's a part of his game where it's just going to look different than how Tanner Mordecai might have operated. You know, he took maybe an unnecessary sack here or there because he didn't want to run. Uh, he was looking for open receivers a little bit longer. I think Preston's going to be able to take off a little bit more and and run and. I do like where Preston Stone's feel is uh, when it comes to feeling pressure, adjusting, resetting, and then throwing the football. I think that's a real strong point of his game. And whenever he finds those short to intermediate routes, those are where I, I think we see a really solid progression here. But at the same token, Preston Stone just doesn't have the experience Tanner Mordecai has yet. He has quality game experience now under his belt, Cincinnati. Um, TCU here and there, um, you know, uh, Tulsa, the start to that game. Uh, he has had valuable experience now, but it doesn't necessarily replace being a starter for an entire year like Tanner Mordecai was going into this year where he's going to be the starter every game, um, you know, provided he stays healthy and all that. Because it's just kind of, uh, it's a different mindset. I mean, you can always prepare to be the starter and prepare to be prepared every game. But it is hard uh, to do it and, and know maybe how you need to do it at the college level in a sense. I'm not saying Preston Stone won't know how to do that, but it's something he's going to experience for the first time this year. So um, that's probably the difference with where they are uh, kind of comparing them right now. Um, so, yeah, West Coast Stang asks, as spring practice wraps up, what are the adjusted expectations for football season? Sounds like things are super, super positive right now. I'm curious if championship game or bust should be the mindset. And this also feeds off of a question from SMU alum 11, which is based on what I've seen so far from the squad. Is there a higher probability of hitting a 10-win season, or do you feel about the same 
as you did in your too early prediction. And um, I, I think <clears throat> the goal should be championship game or bust. And I think we all know it is. I think the expectation is championship game or bust. And that's from watching how much talent they have in the running back room. I mean, Jalen Knighton and LJ Johnson have really come on well. And that is a very exciting piece that I think is showing me that this, this could really be a team that goes to a, a championship game. And in terms of adjusting from a 10-win a type of expectation, I, I mean, I feel a little bit better about their chances to beat Oklahoma or TCU because of how the run game has improved and because we've been able to see some of this defensive line improvement and and the depth in the secondary. And really, honestly, too, the linebackers have impressed as well. So it, it springs a very positive time. There's no question. And SMU is also missing some key pieces this spring due to injury. But I, I think I feel halfway through spring, I feel a little bit better about SMU's chances to make a conference championship game. And I feel better about their chances to maybe pull one of those games against an Oklahoma or a TCU. I, I feel like they're in a better spot. But to the first question of the podcast, Preston Stone, how does he fare? How does he fare in the big game? That's going to be obviously what drives a lot of this. Um, and, and I do feel better about, I, I think Preston Stone's really done a nice job taking care of the football this spring. And you couple that with a strong run game. And if, if the receiving core is healthy, I, I like where things are trending for the championship game or bus mentality, as well as their opportunities to beat an OU and TCU. I'm not saying it's going to happen yet, but it very well can. And I think that's important. This is a season and this is where the expectations, I, I think the goals are win every game. I think the expectations are you need to be in that AAC championship game. It'd be real nice to split OU and TCU and see what you could come up with there. I, I think that's where SMU fans need to probably say to yourself, all right, I feel good about the, oppor the opportunity to win every game, but will it happen? All right. If they lose to OU, the world's not going to end. And depending on how they look, it's definitely not going to end. Same goes for TCU. Those are games you want to win. This team can win, but it's also very important to, as we eventually go through this season together, the context of it all, right? I mean, OU is a very talented football team that's recruited well. Brent Venables uh, has to be feeling like they need to see some serious improvement this upcoming year. TCU is still going to be talented. It's year two of Sonny Dykes, but they'll also be, you know, breaking in a new offensive coordinator, new quarterback, and a bunch of new uh, players at keys key positions that they lost a lot of NFL talent at. So there are all these things that kind of, you know, bring context to it, right? Like if, you, if SMU comes out against TCU and starts slow again and looks the way it did in, in, for, uh, in Ford stadium, then you're like, oh, golly, all right, that can't happen. But on the flip side of it, if TCU wins, I mean, that's, that, that's how the cookie has crumbled, you know, more times than not over the last you know two decades too. But the expectations are you need to be competitive in every game and they need to make the AAC championship. And based on what I've seen this spring, you should be able to have those expectations and, and feel kind of, you know, good about it. Um, when it comes to which position group has been the most surprising in a good way this spring, this question comes from Kurt SMU 06. I think it's linebacker room. This is a room that added a mod Walker. Veteran in Scott Simon's defense, a veteran of playing college football and playing on a pretty good defense and, and good team in Liberty. And he's a winner and he brings so much physicality. I mean, he brings an edge. I, I mean, just kind of thinking loosely off of notes from practice. Ahmad's kind of the guy that, you know, the staff needs to say, hey, 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 kind of stay up, keep the guys, you know, they don't, you know, they're trying to not tackle to the ground a ton. They're trying to wrap up, do all those things, and still while still playing physical. He's one of those guys that he, I mean, it's tough to turn off his physicality. Then you have Jaquandis Burns, who just had an interception in Tuesday's practice. He looks much better athletically and physically this year, uh, entering year two with the program. He looks like he's poised to start, and it looks like he's going to be that guy that has made a big statement this spring to say, I want that starting job. That's my job. 
But then you have Chris Adamora and Alex Kilgore, the two new faces in this linebacker room. You know, Chris Adamora moving down from safety, as well as um, Alex Kilgore, the early enrollee. These are guys that you want to see them continue to develop over the course of spring. And then you can say, all right, then they have fall camp to kind of work through things and continue to push. And they'll certainly be in the conversation for serious playing time. And you feel a lot better about it overall. So I think the linebacker room, you know, Maurice Crum uh, has done a terrific job with that room since he's stepped in there to take on that um, position. I, I really like what they're doing in the linebacker room. Um, this is kind of a, um, S, uh, yeah, this is a team question. SMU giddy up. Do you expect SMU's success at wide receiver recruiting college development, NFL draft picks to continue for this foreseeable future? Is there chatter in the high school ranks, coaches or players about SMU being a strong choice for wide receivers? So this is kind of a recruiting question, but it's, I, I think it has to do with the team a little bit more. One, there is chatter about the development. Uh, that you can get at SMU as a wide receiver. They've shown that over the years um, with their uh, development of just wide receivers, Cortland Sutton, uh, James Proche, Reggie Robertson, Danny Gray, Trey Quinn, um, I mean, Emmanuel Sander, Sanders, so many guys. Uh, and then, you know, Rasheed Rice going now. Um, this, is a, this is a school that produces wide receivers, and I don't think there's any doubt about that anymore. Um, so you've got to keep that in mind when it comes to recruiting. And I think the quality of guys they're bringing in at wide receiver, both from the transfer portal and recruiting shows that they're in a better position to keep this going. I mean, Jamari and Carroll, we had him as a four star on, uh, on, on three for the 2023 class. He looks like that next guy. Jordan Curley looks like that next guy. And so I do think the, uh, the, the buzz is certainly still there for SMU to continue this trend of developing wide receivers overall. Um, so I like the direction of it. Um, I do think it is talked about uh, among recruits and transfers and uh, rightfully so. Um, so I think Jordan Curley, Jake Bailey, Keyshawn Smith, those guys are next up. Jamari and Carroll is a guy who you can look at as next, next up. Um, and, and RJ Maryland, you know, you can also look at, you know, as a wide receiver in a sense, with his ability to catch the football. He's also a tight end. SMU's had good tight ends. So you can kind of toss those guys in there. Whiskey Pony asks, uh, assuming Kamar starts going to class and is on the roster next year, how do you see the running back rotation shaking out? With so many mouths to feed, does Lashley go more run heavy in play calling or does he keep it balanced? I think they want to be a, a run-based offense that can hit explosive plays. And they want to be able to call a run play and call it three times in a row. And they pick up six, seven yards and hit an explosive and, and do all those things. That's where it's kind of different. I think SMU wants to see the yardage disparity come way back the other way towards the run game. You know, Tanner Mordecai was one of the best passers in college football, especially statistically, statistically last year. That's where there's a difference of all right, well, you can call, you know, try to move it a little bit more, you know, 55, 45 run. And, you know, that's great. But if you're not running it with success, you're not going to be a 50-50 offense. You want statistically to be close to 50-50 overall. I, I mean, that's just, I think 99% of football coaches would tell you that. You know, air raid guys maybe – um, are a little different, but even then you get a swing pass, extension of the run game, screen game, extension of the run game. There are different ways to that they view, view that in the air raid sense. But in terms of SMU, they want to be 50-50, but they want to have, you know, they want to be around, you know, 250, 300 yards rushing. I mean, I do believe that. I mean, I think that's what Brett Lashley kind of built, um, you know, built it on with Gus Malzahn and, and, and that, coaching tree is kind of built it on they build it on strong running backs a little bit of quarterback uh run game you know they, he had that throughout at different times in his career um but they don't want to be slinging it 350 you know yards of, of passing game a, a, a week and b 
be be around you know a buck fifty you know rushing the football. Granted, that's still five hundred fifty yards of total offense, roughly. But you, they want their yardage to be 50-50, if that makes sense. As far as the rotation goes, I think Jalen Knighton is really emerging as a guy that you got to have on the field as much as you can. And that's kind of crazy to talk about. I want to see how Tyler Levine responds to his injury. I have no doubt about his toughness. We've seen what he can do on the field. You still want to see how he can respond. LJ Johnson has shown the ability to be a little bit more explosive than I, I think he showed in the first couple of weeks of practice. The last couple of weeks of practice have been much more explosive, big play. So now you factor him in. We'll see what happens with Kamar Wheaton um, and and just how he earns those reps. And then same with Belton Gardner, who's had a good spring, according to Keenan Hall. So they have all these different mouths to feed. As far as the rotation goes, I mean, I think you're looking at Jalen Knight and I mean, if, if he was on the field 50% of the snaps offensively, I think that's a good thing. And then you could go 20 to LJ, 20 to Tyler, and uh, 10 to Kamar. I mean, I I, do, I just I think that's probably the way to go about it. Um, and Velton's got a factor in there somewhere, potentially. So I, I just think that that's how high I am on Jalen Knighton and what he's earning and what he's showing. He's physical. He's explosive. Catches the football. I mean, he does so many things right uh, that it's going to be hard to keep him off the field. And we'll see how LJ develops in fall camp. He might show even more. So it's early. There's still a lot of competition to, you know, come there. And I'm very intrigued by how they work it out. But um, I mean, it's a good problem to have. Um, but I can tell you, I would imagine uh, people aren't happy with it, the rotation, no matter how it play, plays out. Um, Finally, um, on the end zone for SMU, uh, the end zone complex, uh, SMU alum 11 asks, are there any stadium updates, enhancements, construction issues that I can share? No construction issues. Uh, I do know that the north end zone uh, scoreboard is going to start being constructed here soon. It is going to be one and a half times bigger than the one in the south end zone. So it won't look dinky up there at the top of Ford. It's going to be a pretty nice size, obviously new scoreboard. So it's not, it's going to be nice. Um, and then the one on the south end zone will be even bigger than that. So all those things are good things to hear on that front. This year is going to be a little bit of a, of a, um, they're not going to have the new sound system in. But once the end zone is closed in, they're going to have a brand new sound system throughout to pair it all together. So they can't really do that without the south end zone being done because it'll sound weird. All that stuff has to get, you know, uh, aligned, so to speak, when it comes to, uh, you know, putting that all together on the end zone complex. Um, another question I was asked by someone, can I share schematics? Um, I, I don't have any on me. Uh, you can obviously see the ones online that they have with the project, the Weber end zone complex, but, uh, I will say, um, the locker room is going to be pretty unreal. Um, I was talking with a recruit, uh, and they said, look, this thing is going to be about as nice as it, uh, gets nationally. So there, there are some programs, you know, your Oregon or something like that, that, you know, will outclass SMU. I mean, that's just the reality of it, but it's going to be right up there. Like people were excited about the locker room that they did um, with the new lockers. Uh, I think two years ago, maybe a year ago. Um, I think two years ago, but it's going to be, it's, it's going to be very first class. So a lot of excitement coming out about the end zone facility. Um, and when I get um, some more info on that, I will share it now scrolling back up uh, to the top of my rundown um, and bear with me here on our YouTube channel. I'm going to try to share the screen because I was asked by one of our users to try and share uh, my screen on recruits uh, when talking about them. So I'm going to give it a go. Um, SMU fan 2015 asks uh, of the recruits on campus Friday, which ones would you pencil in as having a real shot versus uh, which ones are more of a reach um, for the staff to, uh, to hit. So I, um, See if I can do that. 
so uh, first recruit want to talk about a lot of defense here. Um, Zaylen Scott, Cedar Hill edge prospect. Uh, he's a 2024, 6'2", 215. Um, I liked what he did uh, from a, a, a kind of a an athletic perspective at the Under Armour Dallas camp. He's kind of a tweener in a sense uh, between playing edge and kind of being like a what a Braden Flowers is, uh, which is uh, a strong side defensive end. Zaylen Scott might be able to pack on the weight and become a strong side defensive end potentially. I don't think he's twitchy enough to necessarily be a pass rusher from that stand-up edge rusher position, but he's he, he'll provide size and strength there. So he's a little bit different than kind of what you know they might have in a Nelson Paul or a um, uh, a, a Isaiah Smith or a Jalen Samuels if he returns guys like that. But I I think with his size he'll he could develop into a uh, uh, another um, another uh, kind of a, a pass rusher uh, from that sense. Um, so uh, the next one I'm going to try to share here. Uh, is another edge prospect on on three, which is uh, Allen, four-star defensive end, Zina Umazolu. Uh, he's a guy that um, is really, really talented, first of all. I mean, he's one of the best guys in the country, ranks uh, as the number 127 overall prospect in the country and number nine edge prospect nationally. Texas leads the on three RPM here. But as I mentioned uh, earlier this week, this is a guy that I think people need to start talking about SMU with. And it makes a lot of sense because he's been to campus twice in the last couple of weeks. He's <clears throat> at the very least a player that you circle and you say, wouldn't shock me if in two years he's back at SMU, if it doesn't work out wherever he goes, Texas, USC, Oklahoma, Texas A&M, but he's now made enough visits where you're like, all right, they need to be paid attention to. So, I'm intrigued to see where that recruitment goes. I don't think it's a reach to say SMU is a factor in his recruitment and a, and a relatively big one. I'm not saying he's going to end up at SMU, but he has shown with his actions now that he's very interested and we'll see how the chips fall here. Uh, the next one, uh, if it goes for me, yep, there we go. Uh, William Nettles, uh, the defensive back out of uh, Dallas Christian. He was on campus uh, for uh, Friday night scrimmage as well. Uh, he's going to set up an official visit to SMU. He's got one this summer set for Purdue. Sam Carter's done, done a really nice job recruiting him. Speedy Nettles has been a guy that SMU fans have known about if you're recruiting Nick for a long time now, probably about two years. SMU was his first offer. Ricky Hunley's been recruiting him even you know before that um, while he was at Liberty. So there's just a long standing relationship and a bunch of ties. Um, you know, Scott Natty. Uh, Tyler Foster, I mean, Alex Brown. I mean, there are just so many people involved in this recruitment for SMU, Keenan Hall, bunch of guys. SMU is probably battling Purdue in a big way here. Uh, he's going to get to Baylor. He's got another visit coming up uh, elsewhere. Uh, we just caught up with him, so be sure to check out the story um, on the site uh, from last week on him. But uh, he is uh, somebody that, you know, really you got to – He'd be a really nice land. He's a strong three-star prospect, local kid. He loves SMU. Just can they get past a, what is a really good relationship with Sam Carter? Might be a little bit of that. All right, am I really going to make the the move to go to SMU with them just still in the group of five right now? We'll see if that impacts it. But ultimately, Speedy Nettles is a guy to know without a doubt. Chris Wacoma, the Arlington Bowie uh, safety Four-star prospect on on three, just inside our on 300. Number 27, safety nationally. I think SMU, Baylor, um, Texas Tech. Uh, here's kind of the recap, uh, quick recap for at least for you guys. Um, I know he had another visit set. Um, he's been to Louisiana Tech. Uh, Kansas is in there. A couple others, but um, SMU certainly in the mix here for Chris Wacoma. Uh, six foot, 175. He really likes how Scott Simons was recruiting him. And Scott Simons took over this recruitment from um, uh, from Craig Niver, who left to be the defensive coordinator at Coastal Carolina. And he's done a really nice job. Kyle Cooper is also assisting. Um, a bunch of others on the staff are assisting. But he's been on campus multiple times. So I, I think Baylor, SMU, kind of battling it out there. 
for Chris, Chris Wacoma. He would be an awesome land. It, we've talked about this in the past, but the safety prospects SMU's on are really impressive. Um, and SMU's certainly in the mix with quite a few of them. Uh, Got to get Keondi Henry a profile picture, but the Lake Dallas, Texas wideout will be on campus this coming Friday. He was supposed to be there Friday. Couldn't make it. Uh, now he's supposed to be here this Friday, he told me. So um, kind of a shift in his plans, but he's a top 150 overall prospect on on three. Number 23 wide receiver nationally, top 200 overall in the on three industry ranking. Texas Tech does lead the on three recruiting prediction machine for him. Uh, I think that thing might need to be updated a little bit with his SMU visit coming up that that factors into that. Um, yeah, it should be updated. So um, that one will look a little different once I repull it. But um, a really talented prospect. If you're looking for that next big play outside threat, that would be Keandi Henry. Um, he's got a bunch of offers you can kind of see here. Um, he's got a good flavor of in-state uh, offers. Tulane, Northwestern, Boston College, Purdue, Vandy, Texas Tech. So uh, quite a few in the mix there um, with Keandi Henry. Um, so um, those are the five I wanted to highlight for you guys uh, as far as the mailbag goes. And then for next year's recruiting class, what positions do you need? Do you, I think we SMU needs to be prioritizing based on the current roster. I still think you want to pull a tight end. And we talked about them uh, uh, offering, um, and here I go, I need to uh, share my screen again, but uh, but Juelen, uh Thomas Roberts, uh, he's out of uh, Richardson J.J. Pierce High School. He was just on campus when he picked up his offer. Um, so he's a guy to certainly know right now uh, for SMU. He's three-star, top 40 tight end nationally. Um, SMU leads the on three RPM now. Texas Tech is in there. Um, he's still kind of picking up some recruiting steam. I think when uh, schools start to get out in the spring, you'll see him pick up more offers. Um, but he's a guy to certainly know um, at the tight end position. I think you've, after signing three, but you sign Lonnie Johnson, who's kind of an RJ Maryland clone. Adam Moore's a big body, but you know, kind of a pass catcher. Trip Reardon's your your blocking tight end style. He can catch the football too, but um, you sign three. You've got RJ Maryland for another year. You've got Nolan Matthews Harris for another year. Cam Allen for more time. Simon Gonzalez, who knows what his future is. I think you'd like to maybe sign one to two, um, or at least go one in the high school ranks and then another out of the portal. I know, uh, I think there's a question in here about portal guys, um, but uh, that is certainly a position I still think they need to address just because it was in such dire straits from a long-term talent perspective. Um, I, th I think the wide receiver room could could certainly use um, a little bit of a boost. They uh, they obviously have Wildman Cauley committed from Dallas South Oak Cliff, um, four-star prospect, really talented, but also kind of a jumbo athlete. Um, so you want to obviously find a guy like Keandi Henry, um, or some others out there that they have offers out to and see what you can pull in. I think linebacker, you need to go get two to three. Um, but the room is in a good spot. Uh, numbers wise, I don't think they lose anyone after this year. Um, all the guys have multiple years left. So um, I think that's a position that's in good shape uh, from a returning numbers perspective, but just stacking that up with two to three would be a strong move in my opinion. I think you need to address the edge edge spot and also, I mean, sign another defensive tackle for sure, a true defensive tackle. So they've got some options, a uh, lot of them out there. We're going to do once spring ball ends, we're going to kind of take a look at who made it in, who is clearly a top target, who is going to set official visits and kind of do a recap, reset and recap of where SMU recruiting is. It's going to be a big piece already starting to piece it together a little bit, but keep on the lookout for that as spring ball ends. So a lot of the guys that will tell you at a camp, yes, I'm interested in SMU, but on the flip side of it, they haven't necessarily been to campus or haven't made it a priority to get to campus. So we're finding a lot of that, a lot about that out as we go through spring ball, who's actually interested in SMU in these uh, recruits. Pony Excess asks, asks uh, a timeline on when we might expect our next transfer portal or high school commit. I, I'm just going to say May. 
Um, we're getting close to April. SMU's not going to host any guys, in my opinion, right now at least, in April from the high school ranks for an official visit. So if they kind of stick with the timeline from last year, I think a late May commitment from somebody could be in the cards. Um, and that would cover high school or transfer portal. So I, I still think, um, and somebody else asks, asks uh, transfer portal needs out there still, linebacker um, and um, tight end. Um, so Dean uh, Ralski asked, what is the timetable for the class 20, 2024 football recruits to make decisions? And is there another position, other linebacker that you expect SMU to attack in the May transfer portal window? First of all, Dean, thank you for subscribing. New subscriber, just uh, subscribed in early February. So shout out Dean for jumping on board to kind of like sum all of these three questions up. SMU last year made a huge run in June, and they basically completed a lot of their class. Then they got a couple of commitments right before uh, football season started, and then they picked up a couple of late ones, um, you know, between December and uh, the February signing period. So a couple of late guys jumped on board. The, the timetable a lot of these guys are taking is official visits in June and then decisions in July. What we saw last year from SMU was they got a lot of their guys on campus throughout the spring. And then they were able to pop them pretty early in June. And that's when they went on their run. They had an official visit weekend and then maybe another. And between those two kind of weekends, they were rolling. Um, and so that that June to July is, is another good time to kind of watch what's going on with SMU recruiting overall and see where these guys go make their decisions. We'll be tracking that. Obviously, that's a huge part of, you know, our time period and things like that. Um, and then with the transfer portal window, I think tight end and linebacker, um, maybe another defensive tackle, depending on how they feel about Stefan Wright long term, who um, uh, just returned to practice. Uh, he's in a red jersey, but he's back practicing. I still think they want to attack tight end linebacker and maybe another defensive tackle. They always want to find those linemen. Um, and it wouldn't shock me if they could find the right fit at safety, maybe a one-year guy who enters, uh, if they uh, would go that route too. But um, I, I think those guys would be pretty quick decisions. The transfer portal window uh, is May 1st through the 15th, uh, and then um, they'll, uh, they'll be um, you know, rolling from there. They'll have guys in for visits if they you – know, feel like those guys are ones that they want to watch and, and bring in and see if they're the right fit. And those guys will make decisions pretty quickly because they've got to move. They've got to do all those things in time to get in for June. Um, after most of them, I would say, I, I think we're going to see a lot of graduates in the May transfer portal window. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the time frame. A lot, lot is to come May to really end of July, I think, on decisions uh, for all of these guys at SMU's after. Um SMU giddy up. What perception of SMU is held by high school coaches and players? Do they see it as an up and coming program with a high ceiling as well as good opportunity for education, playing time, NIL, or a G5 program with a small fan base that plays a weak competition? I know it uh, depends vastly on the person. You're right on that. Uh, but in any general trend that I see that I see lately compared to five years ago, I, mean, I think SMU's NFL development has really been what's what stood out um, to a lot of these guys. And I talked with a good number of couple trainers in the area. Um, I always pulse high school coaches when we're out, um, whether it be at camps or uh, go see their practice or spring game or whatnot. And this kind of um, builds into flock of seagulls question, which is what's the perception of the pipeline from sock? Is it a couple kids who want to stay local and play together coach who likes SMU or is the whole school wrapping their arms around uh, SMU and do we think SOC is set up to maintain this level of dominance on par with Duncan Bill and DeSoto for years to come? Um, I think when you talk to local coaches, they're really impressed with how SMU has embraced Dallas. And they're heavily recruiting the schools local, locally. Um, and SMU's had various levels of success. And sometimes it's hard because you have South Dallas, which is where SMU has struggled for, you know, kind of, let's say pre-Chad Morris, 
um, they really never showed up, showed face down there. Now they're prioritizing that. They have the youth camps. They have Keenan Hall, Tyler Foster, Scott Natty. I mean, they have so many guys on uh, – Danny Wesley, of course. Uh, guys on staff, Ricky Hundley, who prioritize that area. And that is what stands out to those coaches. They come around. They're asking questions like, I, I think – I think South Dallas high school coaches fight for their kids a lot harder in a sense that there's there's more respect that needs to be earned, at least until the last two years when DeSoto and Duncanville and um, uh, South Oak Cliff have put that area squarely on the map in terms of winning state championships. Now it's a little different. You go around Sock and it's, all right, this is a massive, massive operation now. Um, where when Coach Todd and them got there, it was it was very small. I mean, they didn't have many coaches. It was it was it was what you kind of would you know expect in a sense. Now they're a powerhouse. Everybody stops in. Everybody sees them. So it's a little different. But in terms of how they view SMU, they're appreciative of SMU recruiting their kids and trying to get them up to SMU. And especially when they enter the transfer portal at times and bring them home. And I think that's where SMU is doing a pretty good job of the balancing act of, well, coach, why aren't you taking so-and-so in the class of 2024? You know, blah, blah, blah. He's got this offer, that offer. Well, you know, maybe their eval doesn't match. And on the flip side of that, well, we don't want to take the kid and then recruit over him in the transfer portal because at that position, we know we need help coming in next year. And I think SMU is doing a good job of walking that line because there's the balance of saying, we love Dallas, let's plant the flag in Dallas. But on the flip side, and, and you know, when you do that, you kind of say, all right, we're open for business for Dallas kids, you know, far and wide. But on the flip side of that, well, if you're just going to recruit over him in the transfer portal, then that might rub some people the wrong way. And I think SMU's done a good job of walking that line. So I think their perception is pretty strong uh, about SMU. I think a good bit of them are getting excited about um, the jump that could come with the Power Five. Um, and I, I don't think there's ill will there anymore. Um, you know, there was, there, there was, you know, oh, Coach Jones, you know, yeah, I haven't seen a recruiter or whatever for so long, but I think it took time, but We've now seen back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back coaches really prioritize the whole area of Dallas, and I think that's helped. As far as the perception of the pipeline from Sock, I think it's very important to have, and I think now that it started, and Kevin Jennings is, I tell you what, you go around that program, and I don't say this lightly, there are very few programs that have the respect that Sock shows Kevin when I go over there and they talk about him. So that just tells you the type of kid he is, the leader he was for that team, obviously the talent. Um, but he deserves a lot of credit for that. Keenan Hall, Ricky Hundley, a lot of guys do. But Kevin jump-starting it is, is really important in all this. And so the pipeline, and this is where we kind of talked about it when we broke down the class, but Randy Reese, very good take. I mean, I think a, a quality, versatile slot, gadget type, like a Roderick Daniels, um, hope he bounces back from his ACL well, all those things. Abdul Muhammad, frame limited, athletically limited, made very good high school player, but I want to see how he matches up when he gets to SMU. And then you have Wildman, who's a freak and a very highly touted prospect. That was a huge land. If they, if they can hold on to him, that's massive. So with all three of those prospects, you kind of have the different levels of what's good and maybe – you know, where you got to walk the line of, all right, should we, you know, take him, take an Abdul Muhammad, um, honestly. And that's where it's tough. And, but the pipeline itself is, is good. And they're getting guys on campus to visit and they're getting those players in that can help the team. And it helps recruit Dallas in that area overall in a big way the Duncanville kids that know the the sock kids or the skyline or the DeSoto or what have you 
that's all really important to kind of build those, all those kids know each other. They grew up playing peewee or um, whatever together. And they, now they just go to different high schools. So all of that is important. So I, it is a good thing. And it's a very good thing when you have a state championship winning program, adding talent to your roster. So um, it is uh, a product of emphasizing that area and emphasizing sock and credit goes to Keenan Hall, Scott Natty, Danny Wesley, uh, soon to be Tyler Foster, um, you know, Keenan Hall. I mean, all those guys are a part of that. And that's where the, the credit is due because you got to emphasize it and credit Rhett Lashley for letting them go and let them say, you know, be able to stand on the table and say, we got to take this kid or what have you. Um, that's all important. And so it's credit to all those guys. It's credit to Kevin for starting it. Um, but I, I think it's a pretty good um, setup. And I think Sock, I think Sock, I mean, they're going to lose a good bit of talent off this roster. But I do think they're set up to continue it because of the way Coach Todd has built the program. It's just night and day. I mean, I think they have like, it seems like they have 125 kids out there when I go out there to watch them practice. So they have it going on. And I think that's important. Duncanville with Coach Samples is obviously a powerhouse. They always get talent. DeSoto kind of the same way. That's tough to uh, beat in terms of how they get talent. Uh, but Sock is still very good at it, and that's a big part of the name of the game. Um, oh, sorry, I missed this question from the team from SF to Hilltop. Since it's spring and we're all really excited about the team, what are the areas of concern and what would it be? I think the interior of the offensive line, you want to see Justin Osborne return healthy. How does Logan Parr and Ja'Kai Clark fit in? Um Branson Hickman, how does he do holding down that center position? Ben Sparks, how does he do in that battle? I still think, and granted, they're going against Jordan Miller and Elijah Chapman, but still think that's a, you know, three spots that can be upgraded. Depth at tight end, want to continue to see development out of Nolan Matthews. If that happens, that kind of changes how I view that room. Um, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, staying healthy at wideout, it, it's want to see Preston Stone continue to develop the deep ball. Those are all you know things we've talked a good bit about, and those are still probably my primary concerns. So, and and I want to see somebody emerge as a as a real pass rusher, um, like a, a real dog off the edge. So Nelson Paul Paul and Isaiah Smith have been trying to do that with various levels of success. So those are kind of some of the um, uh, the worries I, I would say I, I might ha have when it comes to uh, the team as spring runs down. With that, uh, we move into SMU basketball recruiting. SMU hosted former four-star prospect Denver Anglin from um, oh gosh, uh, Denver Anglin from Georgetown this past uh, weekend. He capped the visit um, weekend for the staff. They had Hygier Miller from Temple, talented uh, starting guard for uh, the Owls on campus, and then they had Chuck Harris, a multi-year starter at Butler on campus, um, who's a really good player. Um, look, I mean, this staff does a pretty good job of kind of keeping the the lid on things, but I have picked out, picked up that things went well. And I mean, that's kind of all I could share with you guys. I think um, it wouldn't shock me if Hygier Miller and Chuck uh, Harris took another visit or two um, because SMU did get the jump and they got the first visit for both of those guys. Um, and we'll see. We'll kind of see if they can, you know, reel in one or two of those guys. But then – I think Denver Anglin would be interesting to see if he does take another visit. Um, I think SMU did a really nice job of the visit. Wouldn't shock me if he ended up going back to Georgetown, but he's one of the best shooters in the class. SMU needs a shooter with Stefan Todorovic now entering the portal. Uh, Denver looks to be a little bit more of a fit for what they're looking for, um, and and they you know sold him on um, you know continuing to develop, and he just kind of had an off year like everybody at Georgetown uh, did with that train wreck. So. Um, I text Mustang asked if, if there's anything happening with recruiting that will allow SMU to have a decent year next year. Yes. I mean, if you can reel in two or three of those guys, um, you're looking at a team that's different from a perspective of the guard uh, play. And, and I think that's important as far as who's they, who they would roll out there from a game by game basis is, is much improved, uh, much improved from a talent perspective, much improved um, from a lot of different, um, uh, you know, avenues on that. 
Um, who's the next basketball commit? Uh, Scott Sanford, 67. Uh, for those of you who recognize that name, Scott used to uh, work for us over at uh, Scout in 24-7. So shout out Scott uh, for shooting in a question there. Um, but next basketball commit, at this point, I would, I would say Denver Angler. Um, if I was a betting man, I would, I would put my money on that. I do think they did a good job with Heiser Miller and Chuck Harris. I just don't have enough information on them to predict them. So if they are going to take other visits, I'm going to roll with Denver Anglin, who I haven't heard of any more visits um, for him as of now. Um, all right. So I think that wraps up the basketball side of things as well. I will say we're going to have Rob Lanier on the podcast uh, Thursday. So be sure to check in. Uh, on that, it'll be a late afternoon Thursday posting the podcast, but I've got him locked in for an interview. Excited to have him on, talk a little bit about the future and what their plans are. Um, we can't talk about recruits, but we're excited to have Rob Lanier on. Before we get into the trans or before we get into the uh, Pac 12 realignment and expansion questions, I got to mention Dank Vodka one more time for you guys. Um, again, Trey Feist, uh, U.S. Army veteran, former bartender, said, Let's create a very clean pre-prohibition vodka uh, that people can sip on the rocks um, in martinis. Um, and that's what he's got, what got going. Um, it is just terrific to sip on. I mean, I, I tell you, I really enjoy um, it. You're just kind of winding down the day. Um, it doesn't have any of those added sugars and impurities. Um, they filter it for 48 hours and then distill it six times, then continuously distill it over and over again for up to four hours after that. And that process pulls out those impurities uh, that cause grainy smells, uh, taste, and that burn on your throat. So Dank Vodka, we appreciate them supporting the podcast. Again, scroll back uh, on the podcast and get those tastings uh, down um, in your mind at uh, Total Wine. You can also find Dank Vodka, the world's first terpene uh, vodka at Specs, as well as on Drizzly. So order it. Thank you to Dank Vodka for their support of the podcast. You can follow them on Instagram at Dank Vodka. Check them out, Dank Vodka. Enjoy it, and uh, appreciate all you guys who have already checked out Dank Vodka. Now, on to what most of you have been waiting on. Uh, here we go. Jumping right in, West Coast Stang, do you, I think San Diego State making it to the Final Four accelerates the Pac-12's timeline. I understand these decisions are made based on long-term term potential, especially with football, and media rights need, needs to get finalized first, but I could see the pol positive optics of introducing them while they have the most buzz. <clears throat> I don't think it accelerates their the Pac-12's timeline. Uh, I just don't, I don't see that. Um, you know, now you look at waiting beyond the final four, um, which is coming up this weekend. So I don't think it, it accelerates their timeline. I, I mean, I, that's just point blank. I don't think it does anything with the timeline. I don't think, um, the PAC 12 cares about optics. I, I think they've had to fight their battle here or there with big 12 stuff, but I mean, if they cared about optics instead of getting it right, they could have probably locked them all, locked everyone in a room for 20 to 30 days with lawyers and all the media partners and tried to hammer something out of some time over the last however many months. That's just my opinion, though. Um, so I don't think uh, it accelerates anything for the Pac-12. Pony Excess asks, uh, the Pac-12 was approved to evaluate four schools for expansion SDSU, SMU, supposedly Colorado State, and a mystery fourth. Do I still think they only add two or is four becoming a possibility? Never count anything out when it comes to expansion, as we know. Um, timelines, schools that could leave, go, whatever, can't count anything out. But I do think the Pac-12 adds two. And I think the two are going to be San Diego State, and I think they're going to be SMU. Um, I think that's just kind of what, what it comes down to. And um, you look at what... Um, you know, they've they've been trying to accomplish. I think adding four schools waters it down overall, which I don't necessarily know if the schools would be down for that. I think the way San Diego State is trending, 
on a lot of fronts is a good thing for the league and they recognize that. But uh, this is not a league that, from my perspective, wants to add four schools or needs to add four schools. And especially when those two other schools like a Colorado State or maybe a mystery fourth would probably bring the academic prestige down. Adding San Diego State, which is advancing towards R1 status, SMU, which is advancing towards R1 status, and as we know, one of the best schools in the country, is a good optics move for them that keeps their higher education priorities in line. And, uh, I mean, look, a good source that I trust told me this. These institutions and their leadership at the top, which is the academics of the institution, don't want to make a mistake. They don't want to do something rash. And they're very careful about how this impacts the bottom line of how their academics are viewed. And that's how conferences were started. A lot of it was, you know, getting together a group of schools that have relatively similar um, levels of commitment to academics. And that's kind of what has pushed these schools together. And I think that's important, even as TV contracts and media rights have certainly taken a huge chunk of the focus around what drives expansion and drives conference realignment. And when it comes to the Pac-12, it's still going to ultimately come down to money and creating a deal that leads the Pac-12 into the forefront of the right combination of linear versus streaming is what's important. And that's where they want to be the leaders, but it also takes a lot of time to put it all together. When you have all these schools involved, you have all these academic leaders involved, Um, And that is certainly something to keep in mind as we go through it. So I I still think it's, um, you know, I think it's uh, a a two team ad, two school ad and San Diego State and SMU are the ones uh, that I would watch the most. SMU alum 11, realignment is the delay due to primary networks looking to ensure they have all their sublease deals in place before finalization i.e. Uh, Apple subleasing to Fox, is there a bigger delay that could create some concern? Well, if I tell you there wasn't any concern over del- of a delay, um, no one would probably listen to that anyway. But I do think uh, the delay is certainly not a black and white answer of it's the networks looking at their sublease deals before finalization. It is kind of what I started to allude to right there where you have all these pieces that have to come together. I mean, remember, it, when they're securing the rights to this conference, it's not just securing rights to football. It's securing all the different sports that they bring to the table. It's what happens to the Pac-12 network. It's what happens to um, the sublease deals, like you said. And how does that all look? What is all the mo- money values? How is all that going to look from a numbers perspective for each piece that's coming together? And then you have lawyers and then you also have the academics that are leading this. And it's just difficult when you have new media rights partners that don't have these plug and place contracts. I mean, I've never seen one of these contracts before, but I can only imagine how long it is, how um, detailed it is, how many different pieces of this have to be put down in writing and then sent to the presidents of the institutions and then their legal teams. And okay, that piece looks good. Check. All right. Apple, Amazon, whoever, how does this look? Is there any haggling over who gets the order of what pick? I mean, it is that nitty gritty and there's just not a plug and play contract. And that's the delay. You know, I, I, there's, we've seen a lot of the, buzz around this thing going poorly and oh the big 12 is going to braid it and you know whatever a lot of that has died down the delay is in my opinion from what i've 
heard. It's just simply getting all of these schools and getting these media partners to have their lawyers look at X part, to have, you know, so-and-so's lawyers look at X and then, okay, does everybody, does that work for everyone? Now that it's been cleared by, you know, legal, does it work for everyone? Okay, yes, let's move on to the next piece. And I think that's what George Klyovkov's having to navigate. And if you look at how expansion has been done and how media rights deals have been done, it is the conference commissioner doing it and then presenting it. And okay, that piece is done. Let's move on to the next one. That's how the Pac-12 has to do it. The SEC, they can, one, they're going to be given a ton of money um, from their new partners and the and ESPN in particular to take it from CBS. So it's not a huge deal. And in terms of um, fight, battling maybe over certain details and ESPN has plug and play media contracts um, and, and you know, the SEC has one in place as well already with, with that. But the commissioner does all of this. He does it and pieces it all together. And then he says, all right, I've got something good for you guys. Here you go. Everybody good with it? Everybody's legal. Go check it out. All right, nothing's changed from this. Nothing's changed from that. A lot of the legal teams can just roll through it. Great. Boom. Deal. Billions of dollars later. The Pac-12 has to piece this together step by step. And George Klyovkov has to do that. Update the presidents. Make sure it's trending in the right way on that front. If everybody's good with it, boom, let's forward, move forward with the next step. So I, I really do just think it's a delay of getting every piece lined up because there's no plug and play um, contract. Bumgarner, Billy with the pack invite, the portal and NIL. How good can SMU be in five years? Um, and a quick answer on S. Stewart's question. If they get the Pac-12 invite and the deal is five years, 33 million, when would SMU be fully vested? I say four years. What do I think? I think three, two to three. Well, I guess it would be three. They'd probably have to take two years of a uh, half share um, or roughly around their half share. And then I would think three, four, five, uh, they're fully vested. Um, as far as um, Bumgarner's question, how good can SMU be in five years? I, mean, I think you want to be competing for conference championships in the Pac-12. I, I, that's kind of point blank. And if you're competing for conference championships, you're competing for national championships. You know, you, you look at all the different ways we've talked about how a Pac-12 invite would elevate SMU's program. And the main piece of that is certainly money. But the other piece is recruiting base and your bottom part of your roster being infinitely better than what it is now. Um, that's just because you're going to attract better players. So even the better players that don't work out are going to be better bottom part of your roster players in most cases. So you factor all that in, you factor Dallas, you factor, um, you know, having a, a pretty cool schedule, I think, you know, when it comes down to it, it's going to be a place to be. And the portal success will only improve. But on the flip side of that, their ability to recruit high school players in the bottom talent of their recruiting class will only go up. So in that case, and if you're, you know, keeping Rhett Lashley, who's here for, you know, a, now a power five program, I, I think the, you want to be right there in the conference championship race. It's pretty simple on that one. Finally, um, that is pretty much it. A couple fun questions for you guys uh, to answer. Um, when's my next vacation? Uh, so this uh, Pac-12 invite can happen. Um, that comes in uh, from Seastang, a really good one, funny one. Uh, got a couple. Uh, doing a little beach trip, end of April, roughly right end of uh, spring ball. And then um, this is one for, I think, everybody to circle. My brother's bachelor party in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, first weekend of May. Cinco de Mayo, too. I mean, sounds like a great time for a Pac-12 invite. So uh, keep those dates in mind as far as when I'll be uh, out of sight and out of mind, for sure. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, on three's individual rankings, some guys have little green shields next to their names. Um, this from uh, Liberty... Um, Liberty, but no justice. Uh, that was pretty good. Um, these are athlete verified profiles. So the athletes have taken control of their profiles, um, and are able to update their social, their, 
uh, their social media channels um, and submit their own recruiting video, uh, verified measurements, things like that. So pretty cool. Um, we're the first company to give control, a little bit of control uh, to athletes uh, and their profiles and only grow with NIL as well too. Um, uh, Calchim, on three is entirely power five sites. How did we come to exist? Was creating an SMU site a condition of your switch? Um, it's pretty simple. Um, I knew when my contract was up, whenever that was with CBS, that I'd be headed on three. And uh, Shane and Terry's done an awesome job building a monster. Uh, I think the cutting edge stuff we're doing with NIL and how we do rankings and all those things are, um, and also the tools to give you guys, you know, podcasts like this on YouTube and um, grow that and and just the support um, is is second to none. So I knew I was going to head this way uh, in all likelihood if they had a spot for me and they did. Um, so I run the LSU site as well over there. Um, but uh, yes, creating an SMU site was a condition and, um, you know, that's kind of it. Uh, it maximizes my ability to make money and, um, I'll, I'm always for that. So, um, that was pretty much it, but, you know, just because there's only group group of five schools right now on the site doesn't mean there won't be in the future. I mean, this, you know, Shannon has started two other companies, rivals and 24 seven, and all of them have group of five schools. So, um, I assume at some point, uh, those will be added, but they're not necessarily things that you go out and pursue because they're pretty hard to build into cornerstones of uh, a business model. So um, they're they're going after some some more big names, and we've brought over sites like VolQuest, which is an OG site from Rivals, Florida State OG site from Rivals. I mean, it's a pretty um, impressive group that we're continuing to build and. It'll only get better. I can promise you that. I can't say much more than that. Peruna 08, favorite memory of attending SMU? Um, I would I would probably say the uh, snow game against UCF. That was an, a, a legendary day. Um, uh, the boulevard was canceled. We had a party in the Fiji house. I think the statute of limitations is out on that, so they can't suspend us now. But uh, we just had a blast. And then... Um, Everybody went into the stadium for free and I got on TV and took a fireball shot on TV. So uh, that was a pretty, pretty high part. But um, I was also a Hunt Scholar. So that was a pretty cool experience. And starting the uh, SMU TV show with with guys like Scott Sanford, who asked a question earlier on the podcast, uh, was was awesome as well. So we started the first SMU sports show, Press Pass. So those are some of the elite memories and also... Uh, being president of Fiji was, was pretty fun too. So one change I would have about SMU and what would it be? Um, oh, this is a tough one. Um, I don't even know if it's, I don't know if it's academically as much as it is like alumni engagement. I, ju I just think sometimes because of how well endowed the school is from a large donor perspective that sometimes the donor relations for younger younger people aren't there and i know that's hard to do because obviously you can't you gotta gotta you know appreciate and show love to those massive massive donors but i think that for a lot of like my friends now starting to get into their 30s there are some people that really enjoy smu love their time met their wives there all those things and they are really starting to get into, you know, football a little bit more with the Pac-12 stuff kind of buzzing about capitalizing on those people who maybe aren't giving. But, hey, hey, let me take you out to lunch or let's go grab coffee. I know it's hard to do, but I think that's just something else you can do better. That's just me. Um, so uh, that's kind of it. That is uh, there you guys go. That'll get you through a Thursday and a Friday or at least get you into uh, until uh, Rob Lanier joins our podcast. So. I'm going to shut this one down. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Appreciate all the questions. Uh, be sure to keep it locked on on theponyexpress.com for more. And uh, we'll catch you guys on Thursday when Rob Lanier joins the podcast. Thanks for listening and have a good one, everyone.